Thank you. Welcome. <coughs> when uh, Jonathan invited me, he said, Suisa, you're a Sephardic Jew from Morocco. Maybe you can provide some different perspective. Turns out that I've never really tasted anti-Semitism. I've tasted pro-Semitism compared to where I grew up in Morocco. <clears throat> I have found America to be incredibly welcoming and protective of Jews, and I've been delighted by that. <laughs> Having said that, my daughter, who is single, beautiful, and Jewish, <laughs> no kidding, <laughs> is studies at the New School. Okay. And I got a oh, phone call you. last week <laughs> saying, Daddy, they had swastikas in my dorm room. And that kind of shook me up. It was the first experience where I personally or somebody in my family tasted anti-Semitism, and it's fortuitous that, uh, that I'm here today. So I want to introduce our panel, uh, David Hirsch from England, uh, lecturer in sociology at Goldsmith University of London. Uh, great that you were able to make the trip. Uh, James Kerchik uh, from Tablet Magazine and a, follow, and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Initiative, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, uh, Executive Director of Trua, and Jane Eisner, Editor-in-Chief of Forward uh, Newspaper. Since we had a, uh, Natan Sharansky just spoke and I thought I would read something that he wrote when he was a member of the parliament in Israel. Over the past four years, we have witnessed a resurgence of anti-Semitic activity in the democratic world. In Europe, synagogues have been burned, rabbis have been abused in the streets, Jewish children have been physically attacked on the way to school and inside schools, and Jewish cemeteries have been desecrated. Moreover, the so-called new anti-Semitism poses a unique challenge. Whereas classical anti-Semitism is aimed at the Jewish people or the Jewish religion, new anti-Semitism is aimed at the Jewish state. Since this anti-Semitism can hide behind the veneer of legitimate criticism of Israel, it is more difficult to expose. That was written in 2004, 12 years ago. And I want to ask our panelists to comment on that and are things worse? Are things better? Are things different? David. Um, well, is my mic's working? Um, no. Better. Hello? Sorry. So, um, what I want to talk about first is, is the distinction between criticism and something else, which we may call demonization or which we may call something which makes us worried about anti-Semitism. Howard Jacobson, the novelist, talked about that. He said, criticism, I do literary criticism. Part of this book is good, part of it's bad, it's good with plot, it's bad with character. Demonization is something else. Demonization is when everything about this book is terrible, this book should never have been written, this book is a Nazi book, this book is the worst book that's ever been written. And I think we need to take seriously the word criticism. To critically engage with something is not the same as boycotting it or defining it as in the most evil terms possible. Um, to say that Israel is simply an apartheid state is not to make an analogy, is not being critical. It's not done in a critical way. It's done in a way which encourages people to relate to Jews as though they were supporters of apartheid and racists. And you can see that, so one of the ways in which hostility to Israel as opposed to criticism one of the ways it manifests itself in an anti-Semitic way is, is that it brings ways of thinking with it. It brings discourses with it, and it brings campaigns for exclusions with it. So I think the boycott campaign is really quite menacing, and our experience, all of our experience from 15 years of looking at the campaign to boycott Israel is that it brings with it ways of thinking about Israel which single it out as a specific and unique evil on the planet. And already, in that sense, it's very close to old-fashioned anti-Semitism, which always put the Jews at the center of the planet. James, can you comment? Yeah, um, as someone who engages in these debates a lot, one of the most annoying things I find is when 
people sort of preface their argument by saying, well, it's so hard to talk about Israel because you always, you're always accused of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't see that happening. I don't, I don't see many people um, throwing out that epithet when it's not deserved. Um, like David said, I think there are pretty clear distinctions between legitimate criticism of Israel and its policies. I mean, I think Israelis would tell you that they have a very robust debate within their own country about um, the government and, and what's right and what's not. And uh, certain arguments and behaviors that would single out the one Jewish state in the world among all others for opprobrium. That, I think, is usually anti-Semitic. Whether it's in, uh, as, as um, former president of Harvard, Larry Summers said, whether or not it's, if it's in intent, then it is in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, Rabbi Jacobs, can you comment, uh, when does criticism of Israel veer into anti-Semitism? Sure, I wanna say first just a word about this moment we're in, because this conference could not be happening at a more opportune time. And we're in this moment, of course, where a lot of communities, including ours in the United States, are very, very scared. Uh, vulnerable communities, whether because of race or ethnic origin or sexual orientation, or of course those of us as Jews were also very scared because of anti-Semitism. And one of the questions for our community is really where we place Israel in this, in this conversation and where we stand. So our community, some members of our community, have taken the stance that any criticism of Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. And that's just not true. Country, Israel is a country, and countries, armies, policies, governments are all things that we can criticize. Now, of course, sometimes criticism of Israel moves from criticism of the policies of the state, the policies of occupation, into straight out anti-Semitism. That happens when people are using the word Zionist as a stand-in. So often, instead of saying Israel, people are saying the Zionist entity. Well, why are you saying that? Are you, not, are, you not, are you saying that Israel is not a country? Sometimes people are saying Zionist when actually what they mean is Jews because they're bringing up all of the old, old anti-Semitic tropes about Jews as a secret source of power in the world. So there are times when criticism of Israel moves into anti-Semitism, but it's not always. And a mistake that our community has made, when I say our community, it's obviously some segments of our community, is categorizing every criticism of Israel as inherently anti-Semitic because that actually gives license for those who are criticizing Israel to say, well, you say it's all anti-Semitism, so we're gonna say none of it is anti-Semitism, and neither of those are true. So we just have to be a lot more nuanced in being able to say, yes, you can criticize every single policy of the Israeli government just like you can criticize every single policy of the US government, we may or may not agree, and I'll say also that our community, another major mistake that at least some segments of our community have made, are saying that to support Israel means to support all of the policies of the current government of Israel and specifically the policies of occupation. If we would stand up strongly and say, we are for Israel, we believe that Zionism is the liberation movement of the Jewish people, we want Israel to be secure, and we are against this policy of occupation that is violating human rights and honestly that makes Israel less secure, then we would have a lot more ground to stand on to say, and we're going to stand with other minority communities and we are going to stand up together against racism and anti-Semitism, et cetera, et cetera. And so right now we have this choice to make about where we're gonna stand. Are we gonna say we'll give up everything, including fighting anti-Semitism to support the policies of one particular government of the state of Israel? Or are we gonna say actually, we're gonna speak out against anti-Semitism and we're not going to equate it with any criticism of this government. Can I ask uh, one, one, one quick thing, because on the subject of uh, anti-Israel criticism and anti-Semitism, uh, Sharansky had this infamous, uh, what he called the 3D test, to help us distinguish legitimate criticism of Israel from anti-Semitism. The first D is the test of demonization. The second is the test of double standards. And the third is the test of delegitimization. Uh, Jane, can you comment on that? Is that uh, an appropriate formula to distinguish between criticism and anti-Semitism? I find it hard because I'm not really sure what double standard means. Uh, on the one hand, yes, I think it is unfair to single out Israel, as Jamie said, uh, for things that many countries 
uh, have done or that are not as bad as uh, the behaviors well, of many I'll read countries. you what he says. When criticism of Israel is applied selectively, when Israel is singled out by the United Nations for human rights abuses, while the behavior of known and major abusers, such as China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria, is ignored, when Israel, Magen David Adom, alone among the world's ambulance services, is denied admission to the International Red Cross, this is anti-Semitism. Agree? I, I, yes, I do. But here's the problem that we have as Americans. Israel is singled out in a positive way. Israel receives more military aid under more favorable circumstances than any other country in the world ever. We really are a special, we do have as Americans a very special relationship with Israel and it's not just rhetoric, it's real. And I don't object to that, but then I think that we have an issue because we are also operating uh, with Israel on a double standard in a way that benefits Israel. And one could argue benefits us as Jews. So I think to simply say that we can't criticize Israel because we don't criticize all sorts of other countries, some of whom are not our diplomatic friends and none of whom receive the government aid that Israel does, that just falls down. James? I just have a question. Who is it that says any criticism of Israel is inherently anti-Semitic? I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, we see a characterization of uh, anybody who's protesting against Israel, whether on campus or elsewhere, as anti-Semitism. And respectfully, I disagree that BDS inherently has to be anti-Semitic. Boycott is a tactic. Right? It's a tactic that's been used forever in many contexts. And my organization, in some of the work that we do, with farm workers in Florida is supporting a boycott of Wendy's, which is the only company, the only major fast food company that hasn't decided to purchase what are called fair food tomatoes, right? So boycott is inherently, is not inherently a tactic that is immoral. The question is when and how do you apply it? So I do not support BDS. I don't think it's the right tactic. And I'm particularly disturbed because within the BDS movement, there is first of all, not an assertion of Israel's right to exist within any boundaries. And second, the BDS movement does tolerate some straight out anti-Semitism. But there's a difference between saying BDS as a tactic, boycotts as a tactic are inherently anti-Semitic, which is the strong voice that we hear from the Jewish community, and saying, okay, we don't agree with that tactic. We're going to support your right to free speech. I think the Jewish community's support for the Cuomo bill and other legislation that says that shuts down the right to boycott, which is protected, should be protected free speech. I think that is a mistake on our part. I think we should say, you have the right to boycott. We don't agree with it. I want to say that multiple times because I don't want anyone tweeting out that I said that I support BDS at all. But we don't, we don't agree with it. And we're going to argue for what we do agree with, uh, about, which is that Israel should exist and hopefully also that we should end occupation. And, but we're not going to tr spend all of our energy trying to shut down your right to speak, because mm. guess what? It ends up backfiring is, on us. Is it just a coincidence that all the people who support BDS don't think Israel has a right to exist? Not all of the people. The vast majority of them. I think, no, I think that, yeah. it's, it's, the but reason what? that, yeah, look, if you, the reason that BDS has taken off on college campuses is because for most young liberals, or older liberals, but let's say young liberals, Palestine is the cause celebre, right? These are not people who have spent all of their time since Hebrew school when they were four years old learning about all of the complexities, right? So you say, well, look, here's something that Israel is violating human rights of Palestinians. That is true. There is a military occupation happening in the West Bank. That is true. And the question is, how do you, and we, from the Jewish community, most of what the loudest voices are just denying it. We don't have loud voices saying we're going to stand up for Israel and stand against occupation. Let if we did that, we would shut down a lot of the people who have joined the BDS movement who are not, in, who are not themselves. Um, this, this might not be the, they're not the people who might be at the center of it, or this might not be their, their ultimate passion. And they're not, they're not anti-Semites necessarily, mm -hmm. but they're going along with what is the cause celebre right now. Let's go across the Atlantic Ocean to England. David, you've been at this for many, many years. Yes. 
Can you comment on what's going on right now in England? Sure. Is the situation of anti-Semitism, do you think it's progressed way beyond what we've seen in America? Sure. And if you can comment on the difference between both. Sure. I'm really interested in the use of the word inherently. The boycott is not inherently anti-Semitic. And I don't want to discuss whether the boycott is inherently Sorry, anti-Semitic. Sorry, it's a boycott of a tactic. Okay. The boycott of Israel is not inherently anti-Semitic. I don't want to discuss that. What I want to say is that our experience empirically is that the boycott of Israel is, as it exists, actually anti-Semitic. <laughs> and and the, the, the word inherently is really problematic. Um, so if you raise the issue, um, for example, we have an anti-Zionist pro-boycotter who's now the leader of the Labour Party the president of the National Union of Students in, in, in the UK is a boycotter. Um, the politics which used to be on the kind of dusty Stalinist corners of the left is now moving into the mainstream. And people say, this Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party, Her Majesty's opposition, is he an anti-Semite? And the answer is inherently, I don't know and I don't want to discuss it. Some of his best friends are, are, are Jews and all the rest of it. Inherently, no, but politically, he embraces the politics of Hamas and Hezbollah and the boycott, and he jumps to the defense of the blood libeler, Raad Saleh, and he jumps to the defense of the conspiracist, Stephen Sizer. So politically, there's a problem. And to define the problem as inherent is, is worrying. This happened this week, too. What we're seeing this week, astonishingly to me, is the structures of anti-Semitism, which we've seen for 15 years on the left, particularly in Britain, but everywhere else, are now replicating themselves on the right in the United States. So there's a question about Steve Bannon. I'm not gonna say whether I think Steve Bannon is anti-Semitic or not. Actually, I'm a foreigner and I don't know, but what I can tell you is that the structure of the denial is really, really familiar. So it's constructed as whether he himself inherently inside his soul is anti-Semitic? It's the wrong question, but it's the question that he wants to answer. Because then he can say, I'm not anti-Semitic, some of my best friends are Jews, blah, blah, blah. The question shouldn't be, is he inherently anti-Semitic? The question should be, has he had relationships with racist and anti-Semitic movements? What is his politics? What is he going to bring into the White House? What is his political tradition? So we need to make sure that we understand um, anti-Semitism as politics and not as moral internal failure. Uh, I want to pick up on that because uh, Jane, you wrote a very provocative and interesting op-ed yesterday. And you had a phrase in there that really caught my attention, the idea that you can be pro-Israel and also anti-Semitic. Can you elaborate on that based on what David was just saying? Um, sure, because I agree with you. I'm not here to stand in judgment of what's in someone's heart. I, I don't know these people, and um, that's not, I think, what we need to do, especially as Jews, because we are judged in terms of our faith by what we do, by what we do. And so that's how we should be judging our leaders as well. And yes, uh, we have been investigating this idea of, of whether or not one can associate, I don't want to be, say, be anti-Semitic, but associate with people and movements who traffic in anti-Semitic tropes and, and, and harass Jews and don't uh, believe that we have a place in a multicultural America and still support a version of Israel that um, is nationalistic, uh, that is anti-Arab or perhaps, in their view, anti-Muslim. Again, I don't know for sure. And, and we're seeing that. We're seeing that on what has come to be known as the alt-right, which is probably a, a phrase we ought to uh, retire. Um, but certainly the, the, the white nationalist supremacists that have emerged, uh, especially during this campaign. And they might be some of them are, are, are vehemently anti-Israel, no matter how you uh, phrase it. Some of them support aspects of this Israeli government, but for their own reasons. Um, perhaps it's because they want all of us Jews to go there, 
um, because, or perhaps it's that they see in that attitude a reflection of the sort of purity of nationalism that they seek here in America. So I think we have to get comfortable with this dichotomy, which is hard, but in a way, it's like a mirror of what many people feel has happened on the left, in which you, you, have, Jew, you have people on the left who are critical of Israel or don't like Israel or may not even think that it should exist, but probably have plenty of Jewish friends or maybe Jewish themselves. So that's interesting because you can see on the left, you can hide your anti-Semitism behind Israel criticism, and on the right, you can hide your anti-Semitism behind pro-Israel, yes. for example. Right. Yeah. James, can you comment on that, yeah. the difference between the, the problem two? with these, these um, on, like you said, many on, on people on the left, they see good Jews and bad Jews. Mm -hmm. And the good Jews are the anti-Zionists who pick on Israel all the time. And the bad Jews are the Zionists. And now I think we're seeing, like David said, with this new phenomenon in the United States on the right, um, there's good Jews and bad Jews. And the good Jews are very right-wing Jews who are ethno-nationalists who want to defeat Islam as a faith. And then there are the bad Jews who are the kind of namby-pamby, cosmopolitan liberals. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of this now in some Jews, um, to their shame, who are defending Steve Bannon. We don't know, I don't, I don't know if Steve Bannon is an anti-Semite. The only evidence that we have is his ex-wife in a deposition, okay? What I do know is that Steve Bannon was the head of a website for years, which is a sewer of toxic, racist, xenophobic filth. That's what we do know. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, this, I'll say this now to the Jews who tell me, well, Donald Trump, you know, he has a Jewish son-in-law and his daughter's Jewish and whatnot. Donald Trump is the candidate of the mob, and the mob always comes for the Jews. And if you're gonna try to you know, defend him and defend the forces that are swirling around him, you're just earning yourself a temporary respite from some really nasty things that are gonna come down the line and, and, and hit you when you might not expect it. Right. Robert yeah, Jacobs, I, wa yeah. I, wanna, I wanna ask you a question, because uh, James said something that just really caught my attention, good Jew, bad Jew. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, you're a rabbi. How do you define a good Jew? <laughs> I might not answer that question, but I want to say that I think that your characterization is exactly right, and I think that what we need to do is we need to be able to cut through that dichotomy. And I want to speak a little bit to this question of what counts as delegitimizing Israel, what counts as anti-Semitism, and also to the question of where we stand now vis-a-vis -vis the new administration. In terms of the question of what's delegitimizing Israel, so I said before, that it is possible, of course, to criticize Israel as a country, a government, an army, et cetera, et cetera, policies without falling into anti-Semitism. As you said, that's a debate that happens both within Israel and elsewhere. And the question is when it goes into either denying Israel's right to exist, classifying Zionism as a theory or uh, not as um, and not as an actual country. And I just want to give one example. So um, a few months ago, I can't remember what it was, but sometime last year, Stephen Salada, you might know as the professor who was fired from University of Illinois for some pretty nasty comments he made on Twitter, put out this article in The Nation that said a number of things, but one of the things that it said was something like um, support for Israel uh, coexists with mahogany desks and swivel chairs and mineral water, something like that, and the seats of power, something like that. And I wrote this letter to the nation where I pointed out that in fact that is a um, pretty classic anti-Semitic trope that is now being couched under the guise of Israel, right? Not, you can say, till you can make every possible criticism of policies of Israel, even ones I don't agree with, but the second you start to talk about the seats of power, I think he used the word invisible power or something like that, now you're really an anti-Semitic territory. And their response to me, they published a letter, and but then they, they also responded and they said something about, um, well, Zionism is a political theory and it's not inherent to Judaism and something like that. And that's also the moment when you start to say, well, there's no connection between Jews and Israel when obviously you just have to open, uh, well, you just have to open, in fact, the Parsha that we just read last week to find out where it starts. So that, that moment when you start to deny either that Israel has any right to exist, deny that the Jewish people have this connection to Israel, but it's not 
Um, but we have to separate that from criticism of Israel as a country and the Netanyahu <coughs> government as a government. Okay. So that's, I just want to, can I just say one more thing about um, this, this moment? One of the things that's been really scaring me right now is the ways in which some Jewish organizations have decided that the response to the new administration is to try to cozy up and to get what we want. And I just, um, if you saw the New York Times this morning, there's a full page ad by the RCA, the Orthodox <coughs> Rabbis that basically congratulates Trump and talks about, um, about recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and stopping any UN action, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not only about, I don't actually want to talk about the content of the ad. What I do want to talk about is that a prominent group of Orthodox rabbis decided to take out one ad so far in the New York Times, one full page ad, and this is the thing that they decided to talk about. Um, as opposed to the hatred, the bigotry, the anti-Semitism, the fear of economic collapse, the fear of human rights violations, freedom mm -hmm. of the press, everything that so many of us are afraid of, this is what they chose to talk about. And it scares me because, just jumping ahead a little bit in the Torah, I think about the Joseph story, where Joseph thought that if he could cozy up to Pharaoh, that he would be able to protect his family. And guess what? It worked for one Pharaoh. It worked for a while. And then ultimately, in the long run, it didn't work. And it never works. And the challenge for our community is do we want to cozy up to the administration in the hopes of getting something for ourselves? Maybe it's about Israel, or maybe it's not. In doing so, probably split ourselves from the other vulnerable communities. Or do we want to actually stand with those communities? Because guess what? If things go wrong, especially if there's a period of serious economic unrest, it's always bad for the Jews and it's bad as if we're seen as Joseph in Pharaoh's palace. Okay, so it, maybe it, uh, it turns out that maybe she did answer the question, what does she think it means to be a good Jew? And yeah, I want to announce that the Jewish Journal will have an all-day conference on what does it mean to be a good Jew, because I love the question. In the meantime, David, from England, what can we learn here in America from the experience in the UK? Well, the, the, so none of us are answering the questions, are we? We're just talking about whatever we like. Hey, I answered the question. I'm one of the <laughs> Answer the question you want. What I want to no, say, please. and what I have learned from 15 years of um, struggling with the, the, the anti-Zionist left and the boycotters, anti-Zionism, to make an ism out of, out of opposition to Israel, to make a worldview, is already threatening. And it's th this... Um, way of thinking is ever more eccentric. On the northern border of Israel, there's million, uh, millions of people running for their lives and hundreds of thousands of people dead, and the president-elect of the United States seems to be cozying up to Vladimir Putin. On the southern border of Israel is uh, a, a regime which is treating the Muslim Brotherhood in a way which Israel could only dream of treating Hamas. Um, in Britain, we have the rise of xenophobic and populist politics, which we saw in the summer, with the, the vote to blame foreigners uh, for our problems. And in the United States now, we've also seen the rise of a new xenophobic populism. And what frightens me is that the right is becoming what the left always said it was, and the left is becoming what the right always said it was, and the middle, which I would describe as being the people who are for democratic politics, democratic cultures, democratic states, democratic equality, and anti-racism, the middle is getting squeezed. And, and so I think the politics of, of focusing the world's ills on Israel is ever more eccentric, and we need to address uh, what's going on in Britain, in the United States, and in the democratic world. Thank you, James. I want to ask you, uh, if you haven't talked much, I want to ask you this idea of, uh, we seem to have a lot of tolerance in America for religious pluralism, respect between the different denominations and so forth. That kind of is a little different when we get into political pluralism. So the Rabbi Jacob just shown an ad from the Orthodox Rabbi Association, the RCA. Uh, to what extent could we accept the type of political pluralism in the Jewish community where these Orthodox rabbi can play their instrument, and these Reform rabbis can play their instrument when it comes to politics, so we can have some kind of a 
I don't know what you call it, some kind of mutual respect and understanding for our different views. Can you comment on that? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm not an Orthodox Jew, so I don't, I don't really know if it's my place to be telling them uh, how they should behave and act. Um, I will say, like I said before, um, I think it is the responsibility of Jews as a minority who have been enormously successful, probably the most successful minority group in the United States, um, to have their antennas up and to be aware of what is happening when other minorities are threatened. Um, and I think, frankly, we're sort of entering, or may, we, we, we may be leaving the, the golden era of Jewish life in America. Um, because on the left, you're seeing increasingly um, Israel becoming under attack and Israel being weaponized as an issue and Jews being, Jews being uh, um, attacked as being part of a, a sort of elite. And on the right now, frankly, we have an ascendant movement um, where anti-Semitism plays a huge role in the alt-right, which I agree with Jane, I think is a very clever euphemism for just white supremacy. We should start calling it what it is. Um, and we're now entering an era when, when, you know, Jewishness was just not this sort of, you know, positive that everyone, everyone looked favorably upon the Jews. That it might, we, we might be actually entering an era now in which it might be much more difficult to be Jewish. And something that someone, you know, I'm 32 years old, I've never really had to, I mean, being Jewish was never a problem for me. Um, I've certainly, I could talk to my grandparents and they could say, you've had it easy. And I, and I, I wonder if perhaps we may be reverting in the wrong, uh, in the wrong, you know, way. Wrong Jane, direction. what are the prospects of a healthy political pluralism within the Jewish community in America, where people could have mutual respect and understanding of different positions? You know, this is our opportunity to model that. Um, look, we know that Jews in America tend to vote and act and think in a more liberal direction, and while I don't think anybody can necessarily trust opinion polls anymore. Uh, it is very likely that about 70% of American Jews who went to the polls pulled the Democratic lever. And uh, so that means that we are keeping with what's happened in the last very many presidential elections, give or take a few points. But there's an important um, minority. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so now the question is, what do we do to try to understand each other? And I've been thinking a lot about this because we as journalists, of course, have um, been chastised uh, for being too liberal, for being too much in our you know, bubble, and uh, that we missed. We missed the groundswell of support for Donald Trump that wasn't just fueled by racism or misogyny or homophobia or anti-Semitism, was fueled by a lot of pain and hurt and resentment uh, by people who felt really left out of of the American dream as it's constituted in the 21st century. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to really reach out to our fellow Americans. We're planning a big project at, at the forward to do this as well. And so then I was thinking, what's the Jewish version of that? And I think the Jewish version of that is the same thing. We have to respect each other and we have to listen to each other. So certainly for, for people like myself, I'll admit I live on the Upper West Side and, and eat kale salad, I will admit this. Um, <laughs> But that doesn't mean that as a Jew and as a journalist, I shouldn't listen hard to people who don't agree with me. Um, but I also think we have to do that in both directions. And, and I think it, to go back to the uh, title of this um, uh, session to today, I think we also have to listen to people on college campuses especially, but not only, who are drawn to BDS. I do not support BDS. The forward does not support BDS for all the reasons mm. that were stated here, so you don't have to hear them from me again. And do some you think are, the election will have an impact? Well, I think BDS? this is our, I, I, that part I don't know. I, I, I can't predict anymore, like ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think this is really important for us. I, I think that they're the bad actors and there's no talking to them, just like the, they're bad actors on the right and there's no talking to them. But there are a whole lot of other people who are supporting movements or candidates that we might not agree with and we think are really harmful that are coming at it for legitimate reasons and we need to listen to them and give them alternatives. And I think the reason that the, the fight against BDS 
which actually has been extremely successful because there's hardly any places that have divested from Israel, but still is definitely there and real and maybe growing in intensity. I think part of the reason is there isn't an alternative, a peaceful alternative for people who think that it is amazing that Israel won a war fought 50 years ago, and it's also terrifying that it continues to rule another people. And I think that's what we have to work on as a community and as Jewish leaders, mm -hmm. to listen hard to the people who are attracted to that ideology and to understand where it's coming from, not to demonize it, and, and, and to try to think about ways in which we can engage it productively that keeps Israel safe and secure as a Jewish state, but also doesn't deny rights to other people. On that hopeful note, uh, we have a few minutes left. We always talk about fighting anti-Semitism, and Natan Sharansky ended his opening remarks with some positive notions on building Jewish values and strengthening our connection to uh, Judaism. I also want to talk about building pro-Semitism, that how would we, as a Jewish community, build pro-Semitism, as opposed to just looking out to expose the darkness? How would we show the light, James? Um, I think it means standing up for your values and for what's right. And I think we're now in a, in a very uncharted territory as Americans, uh, where we have um, a president who's never served in government or the military before, that's never happened, uh, who has business interests around the world, that's never happened. And I think it's incumbent upon Jewish leaders in the Jewish community to not be so selfish and short-sighted mm -hmm. and solely think that our interests are you know, only exclusive to Jews and that when a candidate or a presidential or a politician or, a, or anyone gets up and makes um, racist or xenophobic remarks about other communities, then it's really only a matter of time before that person and that movement turns on the Jews. So, the so I know there's been a lot of controversy this week among various Jewish organizations, which shall remain nameless, um, about how they should approach what's going on in Washington right now. Um, and I think this will be a real test of whether or not those Jewish organizations actually stand up for the values that they claim to believe in. So you're saying that really the, the best way, the best way to show pro-Semitism is just sort of to, to fight something you disagree with. So to stand up for what you to believe To stand up in. for the values and so forth. But, uh, what about what uh, Sharansky was saying about connecting within the community uh, to our Jewish faith and our Jewish tradition? Is it only in a political context? How about in a more spiritual context? Rabbi Jacobs, maybe you can talk on that? Sure. First of all, Jamie, I agree with everything you said. I think that right now, in a moment when so many minorities are feeling vulnerable, and we Jews aren't used to being in that group, and other minorities aren't used to Jews being in that group. For lots of reasons, including that anti-Semitism just functions differently than racism or xenophobia. Um, it functions, I mean, it depends, as we know, on having certain Jews in certain positions, which is why uh, Trump's final ad that showed Janet Yellen and um, Lloyd Blankfein and George Soros, right, here are these Jewish, he didn't have to say it, the pe people got it, right? So it depends on Jews being in those positions, whereas racism doesn't depend on there being a black president, for example, it existed very long before that. And um, so we have this, this moment, un an unfortunate moment, when a lot of us are feeling vulnerable, that we have to both help people on the left and the right understand anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. because we're not used to talking about it, and most people mm -hmm. don't understand mm -hmm. how it works. We have to stand up just as much for other communities as we stand up for ourselves. We have to fight Frank Gaffney just as hard as we're fighting Steve Bannon. Yeah. Right? So we have to show that we are there. And we have to teach other communities. I, I think we're yeah. seeing a lot of people using Jews yeah. in what for, they, their own, right. for their own purposes. Right. And I think the Jewish community particularly, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm right of center, I usually vote Republican. And I've seen a lot of people now on the right, they are, they are being co-opted yeah. in, a, in a political sectarian struggle that is not, and, yeah, and I mean, God, some Jews. Yeah, I mean, God help Jews us are doing, if yes. people are pointing to the ZOA or other Jewish organizations as the ones who propped up Bannon or right. any of the others who are coming down the line. And in terms of where people are finding hope and a spiritual home, 
we're finding it. Think about how many people were in shoals in the last week. Think about how many shoals opened their doors on Wednesday night for, for healing services or for conversation. People want to be in those spaces <laughs> with other members of our Jewish community, and we can bring in, look, we have thousands and thousands of years of living through some incredibly, incredibly dark periods. So unfortunately, we've done this before. And we've, and we've held on to that hope. And I think that people are, are going to be seeking it in spiritual communities. We have to be there. And we also do have to talk about both what it means to, to live a Jewish life, to be in those spiritual communities, and what it means to bring our values to life in a time that most of us have never experienced a time like you know, this. I, I know a lot of Jews who don't think we're going into a dark period now. Mm. And in fact, I had both sides at my Shabbat table last Friday night, some people who thought the new administration was a miracle, and others who thought it was a disaster. Don't ask how it went. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to know what you served. That's, that's <laughs> My mother's Sephardic cuisine. Save the day. So uh, look, we're all going to be at Thanksgiving tables in a few days. What happens? You know, you have a Trump voter, and you have non-Trump voters. How do you handle that, Jane? Because are we doomed to just stay in our silos and you know, we only have Jews who are like-minded, always sticking together, and Jews who are like-minded on the right, always sticking together. At what point can we look at constructive engagement between groups who feel completely radically at odds? Well, certainly we're incumbent upon doing that, and for those who are cheering or those who are mourning, we'll get past that, and we should. Um, but. I think what we ought to be doing as Jews is what we have always done in America, and which is one of the reasons that we have been so safe and prosperous here, and that is to support our civic institutions. Because I think uh, no matter what, you, whether you think what happened in the election was a good thing or not a good thing, we are facing a situation where one political party is going to control probably all three branches of government and has an an exceedingly hostile relationship to the press. And I think that those kinds of situations demand that civic life, the public sector, obviously I care about journalism and Jewish journalism, but whatever it is that you care about, um, I, I think this is the time for us to really step up as Americans and support those institutions that have long served as a counterbalance to whatever happens in government. And, um, and to hold our leaders accountable for doing either what they said they were going to do or what we think is the right thing for our country. Uh, David. So, is oh, there a way to do this in a bipartisan yeah, way? I think the key thing, <laughs> I think what we need to do is to make democracy sexy again. <laughs> we need to make democracy sexy, liberty, equality, anti-racism, and I think that's the key issue. In Israel, I think we need to, um, you know, I don't think it's true that it's within Israel's gift to end the occupation, but we need to hold on to ending the occupation as our value and as what we want to do. In the United Kingdom, we need to stand up for a reasonable, rational politics. In the United States, I think, I think defending democracy and a reasonable approach to discussion. And one of the things that's really important in that is we are allowed to talk about anti-Semitism, and we are allowed to talk about racism. And no more will we allow people, either from the right or from the left, to say, you shut up, you're only raising the issue of anti-Semitism in order to delegitimize my criticism of Israel, or in order to delegitimize Trump, or in order to delegitimize something else. We need a rational discussion about anti-Semitism, not denial and counter-accusation. Okay. Uh, on that note, I want to thank my terrific panel. I want to thank Jonathan Greenblatt and all the, the, the team at ABL for this uh, great idea for a conference. And my daughter is at uh, NYU. My daughter's picture will be in the lobby. Thank you very much.